You're muted. <laughs> <laughs> That's not going to be very helpful for our podcast, is it? <laughs> no, especially when they can see you do that. <laughs> they can see me? Oh, God. You're making the behind the camera guy be in front of the camera? <laughs> Intentionally. It's an area of development. My name is Lacey Leone McLaughlin. This is Unfolding Leadership, and I'm very excited to introduce Jeff Hassler. Jeff is an Academy, Emmy, and Peabody Award winning producer, director, and writer, network executive who has been involved with nonfiction projects in all genres, including Queer Eye for the Straight Guy, Man vs. Wild, Cash Cab, Brain Games, the documentary feature film Man on Wire, and Brett Morgan's Jane. As the president of Original Productions, he oversees all development, production, business, and strategic aspects of the company. We've got a lot to talk about today, Jeff. Welcome and thanks for being here. Thanks, Lacey. Good to yeah, see you. my pleasure. My pleasure. So as we jump in today, I want to hear a little bit about who you are. So introduce yourself, your current role, what you're working on. I just started here at Original Productions about three years ago. And prior to that, I was doing... Um, what was one of my dream jobs running National Geographic Studios. I'm so excited to be here. This is a company that was founded by one of the great personalities of, of nonfiction TV, Tom Beers, who I've known for years, who's sort of, uh, uh, I don't want to say an idol, but someone I looked up to a lot. And and I think the company, after he sold it and left, you know, sometimes when, when you have a very dynamic person running a company and that person leaves, the company kind of loses its way, as you know, because you've been doing some, some work with us. And the opportunity to take a company and help it get back on its feet and kind of do a turnaround was really attractive to me. It's something that I've always been drawn to, whether it was show running and, and I always loved the first season or when I was at Discovery Channel working in development. Uh, I, I love the sort of turnaround, ideation, you know, I, I like those challenges. I, I don't want to let Philly come in and just kind of like, Something yeah. that's already working in co. So, so I'm here. We're sort of three years into our three-year plan, and we're really seeing the results of, of the team's really hard work. Yeah, yeah. It's clear. You're a builder. You get motivated and energized by building. I do. I like it. I like it. There's so much possibility when you come in, whether it's a brand new startup or a, a turnaround or a culture change. There's just so much opportunity to to be innovative, to lead people, which you know is one of my favorite things, mentoring and leading people. There's just, the opportunities are endless. Uh, and, and I think there's also, it's so blue sky, you know, the, versus, versus, okay, here's this company that's at the top of its game, come in and, you know, help it stay there. Taking something that's a, a nascent idea and making it real, is just so interesting and exhausting. Yeah. Yeah. Along those lines of interesting and motivational and exciting, talk to me a little bit about your three proudest professional moments, and they can all be in your current role or past roles. But in general, when you think back to your career, what are you most proud of? It would be different things at different points in my career. It's funny. Like I remember, you know, I grew up um, small town Midwest, and I remember driving in the car with my wife, and I had just gotten hired as a producer on a show for VH1. And it was this amazing moment for me of, of like, wow, you know, I really, I really am. I really am a producer. This is amazing. There was no film school in my world. There was mm. no, there, you know, grew up on a farm. Like, like you're going to go to New York and do what? You're a crazy man. <laughs> um, so that was a moment of where I felt really like validated. One of my greatest Joys was another one was working at Discovery Channel, running development and production there, working with an amazing woman named Jane Root and uh, Abby Greensfelder, who were my bosses, and really, really two incredibly smart people who I learned so much from. And we did some really great programming together. And it was a really, it was a really great experience. It was also the first time where I became acquainted with real culture change. Mm. Jane is one of smartest people I've ever met. And she had introduced me to the work of uh, John Cotter. And we were undertaking a big culture change there at Discovery when I came in. And so it was, a, it was, it was really rewarding, both creatively, uh, artistically, and also from learning a lot about leadership and, 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 and the corporate world. Your CV speaks for itself. You clearly put amazing content out into the world. I'm interested in hearing a little bit about the other side of your responsibility and your role, which is the leadership component. Talk to me about what it means to lead. 
I think what I like about leadership is it's it's constantly changing, it's constantly evolving. I'm I'm, I'm your leader, and I think I kind of know what I need to do to inspire you and help you achieve what you need to achieve. A month later, our circumstances have changed. We've achieved some goals, or we didn't achieve some goals. You're in a different emotional place. And I need to continue to think about, okay, well, what do you need now from me? How can I help you achieve what we all want to achieve now? It's not static. It's not, this is who I am as a leader. And this is how we're going to do this. The way I led this company when, when I got here three years ago is different than the way I lead this company now when we're in a very different place and I have very different staff and very different reality and, and the larger business uh, that I'm in is in a very different place. So clearly... When you were coming up in the industry, you'd look at the leaders, you'd look at the showrunners, you'd look at the heads of studio and you look at it and go, oh, that, that's a glamorous job. Well, the reality is, you know, I know that it's often a bumpy, not so glamorous, less than pretty <laughs> way to spend your time, right? Yes. Um, yes. And that's what I'm interested in hearing from you today, which is Talk to me a little bit about those not so pleasant moments of learning. And if you knew that information beforehand could have changed the way you engage. So what are your bumps and bruises? What are your yeah. lessons learned that got you here today? People like to bash millennials and, and the new workplace and the Gen Zers. And I actually embrace them. I love them. I came up with, you know, the people who threw things at people, the people who screamed at people, and, you know, all that stuff, right? And you learn a lot about leadership working for people like that, right? kind of a from like, a, well, I don't ever want to do that or I don't want to be like that, right? And if, if millennials and Gen Z have done anything, they brought something that I really strive just naturally as a person is to treat my teammates with dignity and respect and listen to what they have to say and communication. It's been codified by Gen Z and millennials, right? They're just not going to put up with that stuff. Like, you just can't treat me that way. I think the workplace has changed, right? So that, that's kind of the context around it, I'd love to, to, to phrase this. You know, and, and one of the things that I learned the hard way was you can't just be good at your job, right? We get into positions of leadership because we're good at what we do. If you focus solely on doing your job, you forget that part of doing your job is being a leader. Because particularly in what I do, it is a totally collaborative art. If the PA who's manning the craft services isn't making the coffee that keeps the DP happy in hour 10 of that day, it's like a domino effect. Everybody has a job to do. Everybody's job is valuable. And a lot of times the leaders get caught up in, I'm a star. This is what I do. Rightly so. You're top of your game, right? You're an expert in what you do. Mm -hmm. But that in terms of an organization, in terms of a team of people, that isn't enough. And I think that is one of the mistakes I made early on, which was thinking that my creativity and my sort of judgment and sense was enough. The thing I had to learn the hard way was you're only as valuable as your team and as the team you build, that eventually we're all replaceable. You may be the most creative person in the world, but if you're team or your business or your strategy or whatever is not successful, you will be replaced with someone who is probably a better leader who can rally that team around. You have to pay as much attention to leadership as you do to your job skills. And you can't, again, you can't ignore your job either, right? You're hired for a reason. You're hired for a skill set you have, but that skill set is to me is half of what your job is as a leader. Why don't we, one, say leadership is hard, <laughs> right? It's hard. People are hard. Leadership is important. And then three, it's a learned skill that we have to focus on, build some muscle memory around and practice like anything else. Why don't we talk about that? Like we do great business question. acumen. I, I think it's because it puts you in a place of vulnerability. Sometimes the last thing I think you want to do as a leader is here. I don't agree with you, or I don't know if that's the way we want to go. Right. And mm -hmm. To be able to say, oh, okay, well, tell me about that. Where, where, where are you coming from? It puts you in a place of vulnerability. As a documentarian, part of what I do is I'm a student of human nature, of culture, of, of people's interactions with each other, and we tell those stories. Part of what I try to do as a leader is how do I help you pull the rope in the same direction as everybody else in the way that brings the best out of you? And that requires me to sort of put aside 
what I want you to do and kind of understand what motivates you, right? In my experience, there are some people, you know, who just want to come in and say, hey, here's what I'm going to do and then go do it. There are other people who want to come in and like talk to you about it and turn it over this way and turn it over that way. And they want you to kind of like check in with them as they go along and doing it, right? Everybody has a different way of working. In order to understand that and help people get to where they want to go, you have to be vulnerable, right? We as leaders sometimes don't want to be seen as vulnerable. We don't Mm -hmm. want to be seen as unsure. We don't want to own up to the fact that I don't have all the answers. Again, I think we all say things like that. Oh, failure is how we learn. Oh, hire good people. Teach a grist. Totally, right? (laughs) Nobody really wants to fail. Doesn't mean that our bosses are not going to yell at us or we're not going to suffer some kind of ramification because we didn't hit our numbers. But we really do learn a lot from failing. And it sounds like it has been a complete career progression for you in terms of recognizing, being aware that it's about vulnerability, building the skills, making sure you're in the right frame of mind and, you know, place to have those conversations. If you think back to that journey, could you have learned that lesson easier? Could somebody have told you how to do that differently? What does that look like? The time when I came up, it was a lot about bravado. It was a lot about projecting an image. One of the most powerful people I met at that time, I was in between things and this person was networked to me and met with me just like a general meeting, hour and a half with me. I couldn't believe it. And that was like a real mind changer for me in that I thought I'm this like freaking nobody that this somehow got networked to this person. And we just had this really amazing conversation. But this person took 90 minutes out of their day to talk to me. We, We talked about... TV and documentary and all that stuff. And that was like a big lesson for me of someone who was not afraid to show up on time, have an amazing conversation with someone who we just met and kind of, you know, see where that conversation took them. That was a a very influential moment for me of a powerful person not having to be a powerful person. It goes right back to that vulnerability that you were talking about early on. And if this person who clearly is at top of their game, hugely powerful, is taking out of, taking the time out of their day to do all the right things in terms of showing up, listening, being real, being authentic, right. then why can't I? The, that horrible, horrible old saying about be nice to the people you meet on the way up the ladder because you're going to see them on the way down, right? I think... It, Particularly in what I do, there is a lot of roller coaster for people. You know, you times when you're at the top of your game, times when you're not. I've had times when I've been at the top, but I've had times when I've been, you know, you know, my team came to get the boot, get out of here, we're done with you. And you learn from that. You're not on top anymore. It just kind of comes down to: Are you willing to be real, be authentic, and continue to try to learn? Continue to try to, to learn things and be open to learning things. It really sounds to me that you're creating the future of a sustainable, respectful industry that has come a long way. I've worked with a lot of leaders who, like you, have come up at a different time, and I'll say for lack of a better word, have come up hard. Yeah. And they think that's the expectation. And I ask the question, do you want to contribute to that narrative or do you want to change it? Just because that's what you experienced, do you want others to experience? Did you love it? Did you enjoy it? Did you want to go to work? Okay, no. So what are you going to do differently? Even look at like, you know, the way the military trains people today. You don't have the full metal jacket drill sergeant, right? Mm-hmm. They, they don't because we all know. It doesn't work. Training and yelling at people doesn't work. It doesn't, it doesn't work. It yeah. doesn't work. And who wants to live like that? Yeah. The world of commerce is a world where ideas are going to come into conflict. Agendas are going to come into conflict. People are going to come into conflict, right? Because we all have competing agendas sometimes. Your client wants X and that's an unreasonable ask and we, they don't have the budget for that or, or, oh my God, that vendor we love screwed up that project. Conflict is part of commerce and how you manage that conflict and how you help your future leaders learn to manage that conflict is how we continue helping the future leaders learn that you can manage conflict without it being a horrible experience where people are demeaned or yelled or screamed at is a good thing. And I think all these changes that are happening in the workplace and the attitudes about how we relate to each other are amazing and wonderful things. I probably would be someone who would be seen as like a middle-aged white guy as like one of the bad guys. And so I think I carry even a bigger, more, a, a larger desire to make sure I am not continuing 
to proliferate what was the world that I grew up in. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, I, <laughs> at the end of the day, right, it could all just be words if we weren't delivering results. Because at the end of the day, it's not the business. Like, it's a business, right? That's what we're here to do. Actually, the thing I think I'm most proud of ever is the culture we've created and the results we've delivered with that culture. If I am a first time manager listening to this podcast, give me two pitfalls from all of this learning that they should think about avoiding. So, what are uh, those things that they should just uh, avoid if they're just getting their feet wet in this leadership bucket? You're not as smart as you think you are. Oh, I love that. Say more. You're not. Leadership is about having the courage to inspire people to challenge your vision and make it better. That's what your job is as a leader. I was hired because I had a vision for what this company was going to be. There's a value in rallying people to your vision and letting them poke and prod it and keep that vision evolving. At the end of the day, it's your decision. You make the call. Yep. But if your voice is the only voice that matters or the only voice you listen to, then you're not getting the whole picture. And I'll give you an example. When I was working at Discovery Channel, we had taken in our development team a meeting where we went over the pitches that came in that week. There was an idea that everybody liked, but there was one person who didn't like it. I would often say to the person who didn't like it, great, this is your show. You go away and develop it. Because their perspective would take what I felt was a strong idea, but they would make it better. Mm. Nine times out of 10, they did because they were a skeptic, right? And they were challenging it and they were poking it. And eventually them making it their own and something they wanted to bring back to the group, things would come back even stronger. You're not as smart as you think you are and your voice is not the only voice that matters. If you can grasp those two things, then I think you're on your way to take in a whole picture and then make a really well-informed decision. Because again, at the end of the day, it's your, it's your call as a leader. Yeah. That to me, I sum that up in my head as you're talking. I go insight and awareness. Do I have insight into the role that I play, the value that I add, the impact I have on the people around me? And does that drive the business forward or get in the way? So totally unfair question, but I'm going to ask it anyway, because it's kind of fun. Have any examples or stories of where you got in your own way, maybe you didn't listen as much, maybe you thought you were the smartest person in the room and you had to drive something. Any, any good stories to share with us there? I was working with someone, but I was in like more of the lieutenant kind of role. And there was a project we were working on. And I knew the decisions we were making about this particular project were wrong. I knew it in my gut. Wrong, 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 wrong. And I didn't speak up. When I was younger and no one had really ever mentored me in the way to talk to your boss about, I disagree with you. The night before we'd had this horrible shoot that I wasn't on. It was a creative disaster. It was a financial disaster. It generated some bad publicity. The next day I showed up to work and I was sort of like a number three and I'm walking up the street. <laughs> I'm walking up the street to the, our offices and, and I see like six or seven of my co-workers there. And I'm like, hey guys, it was cold winter day, you know, in New York City. Like, what are you guys doing? They're like, oh, we can't get in. I'm like, what do you mean you can't get in? And they're like, our key cards aren't working. And I'm like, what? And I take my key card and I'm like, and it's not working. So I call the building, the guy who runs the place we were renting and he comes down and he's like, did they not tell you? And I'm like, what? And I'm like, oh, um, you guys got shut down last night. Everybody give me your, we turned off everybody's key cards. I thought they would have called you guys. So sorry. Like, and it just like the company dissolved. Like it, it was a disaster because we as the workers didn't speak up and say, this is wrong, or here's a better way to think about this. Whether that was because I didn't feel free to speak up, whether I was too naive to speak up. As I have looked back on that, and I think about lessons that I try to help people learn, there was not a culture created of someone saying, wait a minute, can we just take a step back and think about this before we rush off and do this? How I always felt in those situations really informed how I always approached my leadership. You're not going to let your team show up with key cards that don't let them into the building. I would always use this crazy analogy of like, you guys are the crew of the space shuttle. 
And I'm the little heat shields on the bottom of the space shuttle. For people who are young enough to remember, there, there were all these heat shields on the mm -hmm. space shuttle that kind of absorbed the heat as it came back into the Earth's orbit. I think that's part of our job as a leader too, is sort of to create it, to create that little bubble where I'll take the heat, you just keep doing what you're doing, right? Yep, and, yep. You get the work done, I'll absorb the heat, I'm going to protect you so you can go do and be your best. As our listeners leave this podcast and return to their real lives, What's the one most important piece of advice you want to leave them with? What's your final soundbite to leave them with? I think for a second, that wasn't in the, that wasn't in the preparation materials. I think, I think. I like to catch people off guard. You're doing a good job. The path to your success, financially, career-wise, your personal feeling about your career, the path to that success is through the people you work with. And if you can genuinely be interested in those people, be interested in their welfare, and be interested in creating an environment where we all are kind of striving for the same thing, you will achieve the goals you want to achieve. The greatest satisfaction that I have gotten in my career have been those times when my teams have been really close and my teams have been very focused on have enjoyed spending time with each other. All right, I'm going to tell you a story. You know the story. What we do for our all hands meetings here. We call them jamborees. We would do them once a quarter and we get everybody together, freelancers. You know, there's probably 200 people here amongst all the show staff and the, the permanent staff and, and all that, but they're all one, right? And one of my favorite ones, we get everybody together and we uh, had a taco truck come and park outside in our big parking lot and we set tables and tents and we, we all ate lunch together. And then while we were eating dessert, we kind of went through the meeting part of it and did all the announcements and everything. And then afterwards, <laughs> we had a balloon toss. You know, remember that from grade school? You know, mm -hmm, and you know, I always ended up wet. <laughs> oh, of course, on me. <laughs> of course, that's half the fun, right? We had ponchos for people who wanted to wear ponchos if they, you know, had nice clothes on that day or whatever. We had so much fun. I mean, so much fun. And we had like prizes for first, second, and third place, right? Like those kind of experiences to me. Now, I don't know, you may ask my team, maybe, maybe they may be like, oh, that's so stupid. But to me, the fact that we're spending time together, the fact that I'm standing there, like getting a water balloon thrown at me with everybody else. It's like, it's like we're in it together. It makes great sense when you talk about values. And when you talk about caring that all this whole conversation comes right back around to people, your story ends with people, people, all of this comes down and matters. When we think about the team, when we think about our role, shepherding that team and the people that work with us and for us and around us. That's great. So That's great. Why couldn't I have said that? <laughs> I was very concise. <laughs> Thank you so much for making the time to spend it with me today. I am inspired and excited by the leaders you're putting out into the world. And I know they will carry on your legacy and do great work as they move forward as well. Thank you for the kind words. Like I asked you when, when you called me and asked me to do this, I was sort of like, do you think people want to hear what I have to say? So I appreciate you giving me an opportunity to talk a little more at length about kind of how I approach things. What I'll say to you to that, Jeff, is not only do people want to hear what you have to say, the reality of our world today is people need to hear it and we need to hold ourselves accountable for being better and we need to hold the people around us accountable for being better because leadership matters. Yes. And it's what makes the work we do important. And for you, you're putting content into the world. So I think the stakes are even higher. I agree. I agree. Well, thank you for inviting me. I had a ball. Um, I don't normally like to do these things, but I, you made me feel very comfortable at all. I'm left thinking about how the implications of the great resignation and Jeff's focus on people, how those two things can come together. Finding talent, keeping talent, keeping people motivated is clearly a challenge. So what I leave you with today is what's your version of his jamboree? How are you taking care of your people? How are you taking care of yourself? This is episode one. Thanks for listening. See you next time.